Well, we're in a series called Never the Same, and from Christine's story, you can see the impact that Christ has had on her, and probably um, a number of us, who knows, maybe most of us in here, would be able to tell similar stories about the difference in our life since we've encountered this person called Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. Now, I've said each week in this series that lives have been changed all through human history dramatically, and right to this present day, some 200 billion people would identify themselves as Christians, as followers of Christ. And so this person, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, the Son of God, continues to change lives. And what we've asked in this series is, well, well, why is that? Does it really make much sense? Because none of us in this room have ever seen Jesus with our eyes. We've never heard him with our ears. In fact, other than the people that were on earth during that three-and-a-half-year ministry of his... No one all through history has seen him with their eyes or heard him with their ears, and yet hundreds of thousands, millions of lives continue to be transformed. And does this make any sense? Well, in this series, we've tried to show that it actually does make sense when you take the pieces uh, of evidence and you put them together. We know that something pretty dramatic happened on this planet 2,000 years ago. Our calendars for most of the effective world are set by the date of his coming, And we said that one of the reasons that so many people have had their lives transformed by Christ is because of the amazing entrance he made into this world. We spent a whole message showing that there were multitudes of prophecies, some going back as far as 2,000 years, predicting in advance just exactly how he would appear on earth, what he would be like, where he would be born, and so on. He was born of a virgin, which sounds like a ridiculous claim, except that with Jesus' life and all the angelic involvement around it, it starts to make sense. And, of course, it was predicted as well. We also said that he continues to change lives because of his amazing power. Make no mistake, we wouldn't be sitting here today, we wouldn't be giving any consideration whatsoever to the name of Jesus uh, Jesus of Nazareth had he not demonstrated miraculous powers that no one on this planet has ever demonstrated before. And were there not compelling evidence, compelling evidence that it happened And so that was the third piece in this uh, puzzle that puts together the reason why. Today we want to look at a third thing, and that's Jesus' amazing teaching ministry. You know, as human beings, we have to be taught everything. You know, a lot of times animals, they're born, and almost immediately they have a lot of life skills, and they can do things by instinct, but we have to learn everything. We have to learn how to feed ourselves, clothe ourselves, all, all these kinds of things. As we sit here today, we have all been learning... All of our life, there's, there's hardly a time ever that we're not taking in information and learning, and it forms us, it shapes us. If we could just pour out on the table all the learning that exists in this room, we, we'd be shocked. I mean, we, we have a lot of knowledge in this room. But there's a similarity in the kind of knowledge that most of us take in in our society. In fact, let me say this. We live in a unique time in history where teaching goes on almost continuously through the media. We're constantly being taught. We're constantly giving, being given messages. The teaching all centers, though, around the idea that we are creatures that just happen to be here. No particular reason why. We're bound by time. We don't know how long we're going to be here. We're going to be here for a, just a, a short season, perhaps. And so the only thing that makes much sense is have all the fun that you can have because you just never know when life ends. And that's pretty much what's presented to us in various forms all the time. You know, enjoy yourself, get what you can, do what you want to do. Nobody should tell you how to live your life. You know, you're just here, and who can tell you what's right or what's wrong for you? You know, and that's pretty much what's taught. We have a a time-bound, man-centered body of teaching. Pick up a newspaper, look on a TV show, and the subject matter will all always be the same. It's time-bound, And it's man-centered. It's about me. It's about us. It's what I want, what I think. The teaching of Christ is completely different. It is, first of all, not time-bound, but it looks at us and urges us to look at ourselves from the eternal perspective as beings that are not just here for a little while, but beings that are going to continue on forever. And it says, don't look at yourself and don't look at the answers to life from man-centered or man-centered point of view, but from God's. It says, Jesus said that it's only from God's perspective that we can possibly know 
the truth about life, who we are, why we're here, how we should live, what's the meaning, what's the purpose, uh, where is the future headed, what happens after death, after these bodies fall off. These are the kinds of things that you don't find being taught in the body of knowledge that we receive day in and day out, whether it's on TV or in a book or whatever it is. Jesus was very different. So we want to look at just two aspects of Jesus' amazing teaching. We want to look, first of all, at, at how he taught. No one has ever taught the way that Christ taught, which is why lives are still continuing to be changed today. Never, ever has anyone taught the way that he taught. And then secondly, we want to look at what he taught. Because Jesus taught things that no normal man could know. And he said things, he taught things that no normal man should ever say. Because it would be blasphemy or worse. And so we want to look very carefully. How did he teach and what did he teach? Now, of course, we can't cover everything that Jesus taught, but we're going to cover some substantial things. So let's just start looking at some scripture. This will all appear on your screens. And we're focusing in on how Jesus taught. It says in Matthew 13, 54, Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue. And they were, what does it say? They were amazed. Now pause for a minute. These people sitting in the synagogue in Jesus' day, they were very used to teaching. They were very used to having individuals stand up in the synagogue, take the scripture, and start to teach and start to quote one rabbi after another after another. They, they were familiar with teaching, but something was different. When Jesus stood up, they were amazed. There was, there was something that distinguished his teaching from all the teaching that they had experienced week after week after week all through their life. We'll, we'll get to what the uniqueness is in a bit. Listen, listen to what else they say. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? They're, they're, they're stunned. Where? They've never heard anything like it. Look in John 7, 15. Uh, it'll be on the screen for another piece. It says the Jews were, and there's that word again, they were what? They were amazed and they asked, how did this man get such learning without having studied? And then in the 46th verse of John 7, it says, No one ever spoke the way this man does. No one ever spoke the way this man does. How did he get this without, you know, studying, without learning? And here's what they meant. There were schools, rabbinical schools in Jesus' time. And for those that would teach the scripture... They were steeped in this rabbinical teaching. Uh, there was tons and tons of memorization, oral tradition on top of just the bare scripture. And Jesus had not gone through any of these rabbinical schools. He had not sat at the feet of any rabbi. And so they were stunned. They were like, where did he get this knowledge? But that was not the only thing that stunned them. It was the way that he presented things. Look at what Jesus, at the end of the, what we call the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 7, 28, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, 28, look at the response of the crowds. It says the crowds were, once again, amazed at his teaching. But why? Because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Let me try to unpack that a bit for you. You see, back in Jesus' day, when rabbis would teach they would take the scripture very quickly set it down and then they would start to quote various rabbinical opinions on the particular text or on the particular regulation or law or ceremony and they literally would memorize this stuff now, I mean from the time they were children they would memorize that well rabbi so-and-so says this about this passage but on the other hand rabbi so-and-so says that about the passage but rabbi so-and-so says that's not true but rabbi and they would go on they, they would memorize this stuff they would have endless numbers of opinions of various rabbis through history that would have commented on this portion of scripture and when all was said and done you could see these were guys that were struggling to try to approach the text what does it mean and they would never really come to consensus in most cases it would just be one rabbinical opinion on top of another but they really were very impressive in fact the way that you impressed in Jesus day was your ability to quote all of these previous rabbis and show that you were familiar with all their opinions on the passage. There, there was an accumulation of all these oral traditions about 200 years after Jesus. It's in, contained in something called the Mishnah. 
They added a little bit more teaching to that in something called the Gemara. It was combined together in something called the Talmud. Uh, the Midrash is sort of a commentary on some Old Testament too. Today, and this is important to know, Jews today do not believe that a human being is capable of reading the Bible, which for them would be the Old Testament, unless you are steeped in Talmud, which are all these oral traditions passed down through the years. In Jesus' day, Josephus, who was um, on the scene in, Jose in Jesus' day, he made it very clear that the oral tradition that these religious leaders had was considered not just equal to Scripture, it was considered above Scripture, and as it is this day. Uh, the Talmud, all these oral traditions that are accumulated, is the lens through which Jews today read their Old Testament, which is why still to this day they don't understand God or Scripture and why they miss their own Messiah. So when it's saying that Jesus taught as one with authority, here's what they meant. He never quoted any of these rabbis. He never said, Rabbi Yohanan says this, and Rabbi Shiltiel says that, and Rabbi Reuben says this. No, no, no. Jesus stood, and he spoke the word of God, and he spoke it authoritatively. He spoke it as only one that was the author of the book, not just someone trying to interpret the book would speak it because he was the author he was the son of God God the son God in flesh the eternal I am he was the one that was used of the spirit to put together through all the various human authors the scripture and so Jesus taught like the author of he taught with authority now let me give you a little bit more on this to show you why this ran Christ into trouble uh, with the religious leaders today I, I mean I'm sure it's probably been curious to some why is it that the Jews the religious leaders in particular rejected Jesus why didn't they receive him as Messiah why did they turn against him why did they conspire to kill him what was it that he did that made them so angry that they would go to this extent look at what it says in Matthew 15 it says then some of the Pharisees these were some of the religious teachers in Jesus day and the teachers of the law they came to Jesus from Jerusalem and they asked why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? These were these oral traditions that were authoritative over the scripture. He says, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. That's not in the Bible, but it was in their oral tradition. They had made it something really, really big in Jesus' day. Jesus responds to them. He says, you nullify the word of God for the sake of your, and what is the word? Tradition. They had elevated their oral traditions, the teachers, the opinions of various rabbis above the word of God. Listen, I'm try not trying to offend anyone because we have a lot of Catholics, ex-Catholics and so forth in this church. But Catholicism is the exact same sort of a phenomenon. In the Catholic church, you have three differing authorities that compete against one another. They have the Bible, as we do as one authority, but then you have the Pope. When the Pope is in office, when he speaks, I believe the term is ex cathedra, his word is considered equal with the Bible. Then you have the accumulated writings of the cardinals through the centuries, and these are also another authority. And so you have the opinion of the popes, the opinion of the cardinals, and scripture. You have three competing authorities, which is why there is such tremendous confusion in the Catholic Church, and, and why what they do week in and week out doesn't resemble the simplicity and the beauty of what we find in the New Testament. But Jesus had the same thing in his day. The, the religious leaders had elevated their oral traditions above the Word of God, the Old Testament, and Jesus was on the scene to bring the people back to the Word of God, to show the people that ordinary, simple, imperfect people could go to the Old Testament and meet God. They could understand the Scripture. If they came with humble, teachable hearts and sat under the right kind of teachers, they could understand. Jesus was trying to bring people back to the truth. Look at the way this goes on. So he says to them, you nullify the Word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites, he calls them. He says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. They worship in vain. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but what? Rules, Rules taught by what? Man. You see, this was the difference. Jesus spoke from the scripture. He opened the proper meaning of it up, and he spoke authoritatively. He completely ignored what was the established uh, body of belief in, in his day amongst the religious leaders. 
and he combated them because of that. Now, when somebody takes your legs out from under your leg, you have to understand, these, these rabbis in Jesus' day, these Pharisees, these teachers of the law, these scribes, let's just take a scribe. A scribe couldn't even be a scribe until he was about 40 years of age, and he would have had to, from this high up, sit at the feet of a rabbi. They had a term, be covered in the dust of the rabbi, meaning that you sit at the feet of your rabbi, and you just live to understand the teachings of your rabbi and to obey the teachings of your rabbi and to become like your rabbi. So here you had these people that were steeped in this stuff. They had dedicated an immense amount of time, hours and hours each day, each week, all through their lives. They finally get to be a scribe or a teacher of the law or a Pharisee. They have built their whole life on this, and they have gained great credibility in the community. They were like the superstars in, the, in those days. I know it's hard to believe, but they were highly esteemed by the people. And along comes Jesus. And essentially, he stands authoritatively, not caring one iota about any of the rabbinic opinions, and he, in essence, says, all you guys have been teaching is wrong. You have not only taught wrong, in essence, you have so distorted the character of God that people don't even think that, that God cares about them anymore. They don't even think they could ever, you know, amount to anything that would be pleasing to God. They don't even like God because of the way you guys have depicted God. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the scribes, they depicted God as this, this being that was just fascinated with all these little ceremonial details as opposed to really loving and caring about people. And Jesus came to change that. Now, like I say, when you have somebody cut your legs out from under you like that and you're a well-established, well-respected authority, you know, when, you're, when your pride is, is cut, you can act in one way or another. Let me give you a little story that I've shared before that sort of shows how this goes. There was this lady that went to her dentist. And when she went to the dentist's office, she's sitting in the chair, nothing to do. She looks at the wall, and she saw the little plaque. And she saw this name, and she said, boy, that's interesting. I remember. That's a guy I had a crush on back in high school. And um, she looked at the dentist, and she thought, no, nah, there's no way. You know, he, he's balding and gray, and he's deep lines in his face. He's, this guy's too old. So, you know, he did his little thing. He worked on her teeth and everything. And then... Um, at the close, she thought, ah, oh, I'll just ask. And she said, did you by any chance go to, to Morgan High School? And he says, yes, indeed, I did. I'm a Mustang. I graduated in 1959. And the lady said, well, I went to Morgan High School, too. And the dentist said, wow. He said, what class did you teach? <laughs> Let it. <laughs> Delayed. It was like that in the first service, too. It's okay. <laughs> now, when that happens... <laughs> There's only one or two ways you can react. You either duck your head and say, oh, I'm an idiot. I, I was proud and foolish, and, and, you, and you were humbled by it, and you become teachable. Pharisees, religious leaders, scribes, they could have acknowledged. They saw Jesus' miracles. They were powerless. They couldn't do anything. They had seen it. They never even tried to deny Jesus' miracles. They, they knew that he was sinless. He got right in their face at one point. It says, which of you can charge me with sin? They were silent. But instead, they resisted him because of their pride. You see, wounded pride, you either let it do its good work and you become humble and teachable, or you get defensive and you get angry, and you're going to win back what you think someone has taken away. You're going to get your prestige back. You're going to get your credibility back. And that's what set these religious leaders on a course that, of course, led to their, their destruction and their rejection um, of the Messiah. So Jesus taught authoritatively. And it was, it was something that brought a conflict to these religious leaders of his day. But, but Jesus also taught in a way that no one has ever, ever taught um, since. No one ever will again. Um, when Jesus would teach at certain times, he would illustrate what he was teaching in rather dramatic ways. Let me give you a couple examples. In Luke chapter 5, and this will all be on the screen, there were some guys that had a friend who was paralyzed. And there were so many crowds around a house, they couldn't get the paralyzed guy to Jesus. They knew Jesus could heal him. He was healing everyone. So they dig a hole in the roof of the house and lower this guy down in front of Jesus. This is where it picks up. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are, what is the word? Forgiven. Forgiven. you got to let this sink in. We're, we're so used to this stuff, I don't think we get the impact. Imagine... A human being, 33 years old maybe, uh, coming to you, 
and announcing authoritatively your sins are forgiven. They're just a human being, as far as you can tell. That's, that's pretty amazing claim. Look at the reaction of the religious leaders. They, they got it very clearly. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks, what is the word? Blasphemy. Blasphemy. They knew. They knew. Who can forgive sins but who? God alone. And they were absolutely right. They were right. Only God can forgive sins. But yet Jesus said, son, your, your sins are forgiven. Now he's going to illustrate his right or his authority to teach what he taught as this thing goes on. He says, why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take up your mat, and go home. Immediately, he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and he went home praising God. Nobody's ever taught like that. It's one thing to say to someone, your sins are forgiven. It's a whole different ballgame to say, I'm going to prove I have the authority. I'm going to take a paralyzed man and restore him instantly before your eyes. No one's ever illustrated their teaching in the way that Jesus did. Let me show you one more example in John's gospel. In John chapter 11, uh, a dear friend of Jesus named Lazarus had died. He had two sisters, Mar Martha and Mary. Lazarus had been dead for four days when this, this scene picks up. Jesus is talking to Martha, one of the sisters. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Now pause, break out one, one more time. Imagine today somebody in your office, 33 years old, let's say. They come to you and say, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, yet will he live. You'd be thinking, you're so stinking crazy. I can't believe you're loose on the streets. <laughs> right? <laughs> you, you should be. <laughs> you know? You, we have to sometimes go back and realize the shock. No man has ever taught the way Jesus taught. And, and the people, they, they got it. The shock came. And so... He says to Martha, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then he says to Martha, do you believe this? That's an awkward situation, isn't it? She says, yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ or the Messiah, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. Jesus then walks over to the tomb where they had laid Lazarus. He gets them to remove the stone. He says in verse 39, take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face, burial cloth, all wrapped up in gauze. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Now, it's one thing to stand there and say, I'm the resurrection and the life. Anybody could say that. You could say it, I could say it. But when you say it and then you illustrate it by raising a man back to life who has been dead for four days... People knew it. In fact, if you read on after this, lots of attention was given to this miracle. The religious leaders really hated it because people were, were following Jesus in droves because of this. Four days this guy's dead. He comes out still wrapped in the burial gauze, and they can see with their own eyes that when Jesus says something, even though he is saying things that no normal human dares say, he has the power to actually carry these things out. Nobody's ever taught in the way that Jesus taught. Nobody's ever taught with the authority because Jesus is the word in flesh. He is the authority. He's the, the, the essence of all the writing in Scripture. And when he came to this planet, he lovingly wanted people to know what God was really like, what the heart of God was like. The religious leaders in Jesus' day had completely distorted God's image. And all down through time, one heart here and one heart there, Here's the teaching of Christ, captures, and they are captured by that teaching, and they're never the same. No one's ever taught like Jesus, and no one's ever taught what he taught. Now, the truth of the matter is, 
and this is the uncomfortable thing, that even though the religious leaders in Jesus' day had so much compelling evidence that he was the Messiah, whether it was the, the prophecies of their own scripture or whether it was the miracles that he did, whether it was his sinless life, uh, the, the evidence was overwhelming. But some people, it really doesn't matter how much evidence they have, they don't want the evidence. And if you don't want the evidence, uh, you, you can always come up with a reason why not to believe. I came across a cute story, a guy named uh, William Steig, he wrote a children's book, and this story is from it. It's a, uh, it's a little illustrated children's book, and in the story there's a, uh, a marionette maker, you know, a puppet maker, wooden marionettes with strings and so forth, and he just made two marionettes, and he painted one pink, and he painted one yellow, and he laid them out on some newspaper out in the sun to dry, and so suddenly they come to life. Uh, in this little story. So, Yellow sits up and asks, do you know what we're doing here? The, the yellow marionette asks the pink marionette. And so begins the debate between the two marionettes over the origin of their existence. Pink surveys their well-formed features and concludes, someone must have made us. Yellow disagrees. I say we're an accident. And he outlines a hypothetical scenario of how it might have happened. A branch might have broken off a tree and fallen on a sharp rock, splitting on the end of the branch into two legs. Then the wind might have sent it tumbling down a hill until it was chipped and shaped. Uh, perhaps a flash of lightning struck it in such a way so as to splinter the wood into arms and fingers. Eyes might have been formed by woodpeckers boring into the wood. With enough time, a thousand million, maybe two and two and a half million years, lots of unusual things could happen, said Yellow. Why not us? The two figures argue back and forth. One for there the must be a creator, the other one, no, it's purely accidental. In the end of the discussion, is cut short between the two of them by appearance of the marionette maker. And the marionette maker walks over and he looks at each of them and he says to himself, ah, they're dry. And he picks them up and sticks them under their arm and it closes out with this. Peering out from under the man's arm, yellow whispers in Pink's ear, who is this guy? <laughs> Point being, really doesn't matter how much evidence some people are given. Really doesn't matter that all through human history, lives have been continuously transformed in a positive way by this one called Jesus. Doesn't matter the compelling evidence, historical evidence, that he is who he said he is. It's never enough for some. It's never going to be enough. It was never enough for the religious leaders in Jesus' time. Because there were personal uh, biases that they had for that. Well, nobody ever taught like Jesus, but nobody ever taught what he taught either. Let's look a little more carefully at some of the basic teachings that just caused Jesus' teaching to be totally different than anything the planet has ever seen. In John 14, 6, this is the last night that he was going to be with his disciples. He had already told them at the beginning of his ministry, three and a half year ministry, in the middle, twice at the end, he told them he would ultimately die, he would go to the cross, he'd be, you know, taken by the leaders and crucified, and that he would rise from the dead. He predicted his own resurrection umpteen times. Last night he's with his disciples. He's speaking to Thomas, one of the disciples. Thomas wanted to see the Father, and Jesus answered, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, that's about as narrow and intolerant a statement as you could possibly hear. I mean, let, let's consider what Jesus is saying there. Jesus is saying he is the singular way to God. He is the embodiment of truth about life and that no one will come to the Father, no one will get to God except through him. Now, we, we live at a time where that kind of talk is considered obnoxious and ignorant. Okay, we, we, are, we are taught in many, many ways that we are to be tolerant that one person's point of view or one person's particular, particularly their religious point of view, is as good as another. And that if we were ever to say that that isn't so, then we're ignorant and we're intolerant because, you know, why shouldn't their point of view be as good as anyone else's? But I, I always approach that a little differently. M granted, my point of view means nothing. But Jesus said this, not me. You see, th the real problem that the people have with 
this whole tolerance issue, it's not with us, it's with Jesus. Because he said that there is no other way to God except through him. So, so let's really let this sink in. That means that every other global religion, according to Jesus, not me, I didn't say this, every other religion is dead wrong. Dead wrong. And they're not going to find God. That really sounds intolerant. I mean, just think of all the billions of people. That's pretty intolerant. But supposing that it's true, no one's ever claimed this kind of thing before. Jesus did. What about the evidence of his life? What about the evidence of the miracles and so forth? Let me give you something that I've given before in here to think about. If I told you that my name is Randy Michael Goldenberg, and I showed you my driver's license, and I showed you my birth certificate, and you saw, yes, I was born in July 13th, 1950 in Washington, D.C., and, you know, I showed you some other information indicating, you know, that I'm Randy Goldenberg, most of you would agree. And I'd say, yeah, I'm Randy Goldenberg. I've been Randy Goldenberg for way too long. It's getting longer all the time. I am Randy Goldenberg. Now, let's just say that we brought in another auditorium full of people, and I told him, I said, my name is Randy, Randy Michael Goldenberg, just to let you know my middle name. And they all decided, well, we don't believe it. We don't, we don't, we don't think you are. Uh, we, we sincerely believe that your name is Michael Thompson. And I said, but no, 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 you don't understand. I have been Randy Goldenberg for a long, long time. I, I am Randy Goldenberg. But they said, well, look at how many of us there are. There, there's a thousand of us, and we, we don't believe it. Let, let's expand this. Let's say that I got a whole um, stadium full of people, 92,000 people, you know, and they all get together and they say, we, they shout, we don't believe you're Randy Goldenberg. But I say, but I am Randy Goldenberg. Let, let's go bigger. We get everybody in the United States, 330 million people, and we pack them all together. And they all together in harmony, they scream at me, you are not Randy Michael Goldenberg. And I raise my puny little finger and I say, oh, yes, I am. Let's go global. Let's go global. Let, let's get 7 billion people, 7.5 billion people. Let's get them all together. And they say, we do. They shout. It's deafening. You are not Randy Michael Goldenberg. And I stand there against every one of them, defiant with my little puny self. And I say, yes, I am Randy Goldenberg. I have been since 1950. I will be Randy Goldenberg. I'll always be Randy Michael Goldenberg. You're all wrong, all seven and a half billion of you. But they say, you're crazy, we're sincere. We're sincere. We believe you're someone else. And I say, I don't care how sincere you are. You're wrong. You see, that's what it comes down to. They, all seven billion, would be wrong. Because I actually am Randy Michael Goldenberg. Jesus either was a liar or a lunatic, and there's no evidence that he ever lied, and he certainly didn't behave like a lunatic, the most beautiful life that's ever lived. Multitudes wouldn't have followed him if they saw any sign of lunacy. So here's the thing. He was either telling the truth, and he is the creator. He is the only savior. There is no other way to God through him, regardless of what our opinions are. Or he's a liar. Was he telling the truth or not? It's just like gravity. You know, a person could sincerely believe that there's no such thing as gravity. But if they jumped off the top of a high enough building, they'd find out rather quickly that it exists, whether they believe it or not. And, and so this whole idea of tolerance, let me rephrase it for you. Yes, we should be respectful, okay, to people's point of view. But they should also be respectful when we say, I believe I personally believe in Jesus, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. He said he's the only way, and I trust him. And we should not shrink back from saying that, because that, according to Jesus, is the truth. No one's ever said things like this before. Jesus taught that. Listen to what else he taught in John's Gospel, chapter 8. He said to some people that were opposing him and challenging him, he said, you are from below, meaning this earthly dimension, the only thing we know about, he says, you are from below, but I am from, what does it say? Above, Above meaning a whole different dimension. Uh, physicists now are starting to learn that there's, there's lots of other dimensions, they theorize, maybe as many as 10 or more. He says, you're from below, I'm from above, I'm from a different realm of reality. 
He says, you are of this world, meaning this physical world. He says, I am not of this world from a different dimension. But then he really puts the icing on the cake. He says to them, I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be. You will indeed die in your sins. No one's ever taught that kind of thing before. A picture again. A peasant carpenter standing before, 33 years old maybe, standing before other human beings and saying, if you don't believe that I am the Messiah, the Son of God, the Word made flesh, the creator of the universe, the Savior of the world, if you don't believe, I'm just a 33-year-old peasant, but if you don't believe it, you're going to die in your sins. No one's ever taught this kind of thing and been taken seriously, but Jesus did. Make no mistake about the clarity and the serious matter of what he taught. But he did teach that. Listen to another thing that he said, and this is just mind-boggling. In Matthew 24, verse 35, he said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will what? Never pass away. Now again, picture any human being making this kind of a claim. Standing on the earth, again, peasant carpenter, and he's never written a book himself, no indication he ever wrote anything down himself. And he stands and he makes this claim, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. That's a pretty amazing claim. And yet here we are, 2,000 years later, and his words have not passed away. Year after year after year, the Bible is the bestseller by far of any book translated into nearly every language on the planet. Jesus said that his words would stand, and here they are. That's, that's a pretty remarkable claim for it to have taken place and passed, and yet we see that it has. Look at some of his other teaching in the Gospel of John again. If, um, if we needed more clarification about who Jesus said he was, he meets this woman at a well, and the woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. He told the same thing to the religious leaders when they were drilling him just before he went to the cross. Are you the son of God? Are you the son of God? Are you the Messiah? And he said, yes, I've told you already. But he tells this woman with crystal clarity who he was. John 5, listen to what else he taught. He's teaching human beings face to face. He's telling people this. Before he went to the cross, he says, look, for just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the Father, what? Judges who? No one. The Father's not, Jesus is telling these people, the Father's not going to judge you, but look at what he goes on to say. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to who? The Son. Pause once more. Here's a human being, a 33-year-old human being, standing there telling people, I am the God before whom you will stand to be judged someday. You will stand before me, and I will determine your eternal destiny. That's a, that's a mind-boggling claim. But that's part of Jesus' teaching. But then he, he takes it even further. He says, that all, in other words, he's entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may Honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Now this, for a Jew, would have been the end of it all. You see, the Jews so revered the name of God, they wouldn't even pronounce it. And Jesus is standing there telling these Jews, unless you honor, which means worship, submit, uh, completely yield yourself to me the way you do the God whose name you're, you're afraid to even pronounce, unless you, in other words, worship me as God, you do not have the Father either. He's claiming as a human being on earth to be God with crystal clarity. And, and he says that if people ignore him, well, they, they don't have the Father either because he's the revelation of the Father. He goes on to say, I tell you the truth. He says, a time is coming and now has come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, 
And those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. Here's Jesus saying there's a day coming, the last day it's called in Scripture, where he will resurrect everyone, everyone from all time. And they will stand before him to be judged and to receive their eternal uh, destiny. That's, a, that's an amazing claim. That's an amazing teaching for one that was a human, but more than a human. But that's exactly what Jesus taught. Let me take it further. In John, John's Gospel, chapter 10, Jesus said, I and the Father, meaning the one the Jews called God, I and the Father are what? One. He's clearly claiming to be God, equal with the Father. He says, I and the Father are one. Philip, one of his disciples, last night Jesus was with his guys on earth. Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, and it will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen, what does it say? Seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Take this in. Jesus was saying to his disciples, you want to see God? That's what Philip was saying. Show me God. Show me the Father. And Jesus was saying, I've been with you three and a half years. How can you say, show me the Father? I'm here. Jesus, the Word, the eternal Word, God, the eternal Son, was the revelation of the Father. The Jews had so distorted the image of the Father that the people in Jesus' day thought that their cases were hopeless, that, that they could never please God, that God would never be interested in them, that he didn't care about broken people, he didn't care about sinful people, he didn't care about imperfect people. You had to be scrupulously devoted to all these oral traditions of the Jewish religious leaders, and you had to live with this, this scrupulous concern of keeping every little ritual and dotting every little I and T, and, and, and Jesus came and said, no, that's, that's not what the Father's like. I'm what the Father is like. But he clearly claimed that if you want to know God, you want to see God, at least those that saw Jesus saw God with their own eyes at that time. That's quite a claim. Nobody has ever walked this planet and been taken seriously that taught that. In John's Gospel again, in John chapter 6, verse 40, he said, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have what? Eternal life. And I will raise him up the last day. Once again, what a claim. Jesus is standing there and saying to people, before he went to the cross, mind you, he's standing there and saying, if you believe in me, if you'll put your faith in me, that's what that word believe means, if you'll become my follower, you have to take it in a Jewish context. It meant to immerse yourself in Jesus, complete, entire trust, fully following him. Jesus says, but if you'll put your faith in me, you have eternal life right now. Now, that's quite a claim. And he says, not only do you have eternal life right now, I'll raise you up on the last day. I, I claim to have the ability to do that. Now, this, this is a good place for us, as we're considering the amazing teaching of Jesus, to think for ourselves. Jesus promised that if a person believes in him, they have, present tense, eternal life. That's why Christians, when, when a Christian says, I know I have eternal life, I know my sins are forgiven. We're not being arrogant, we're not being presumptuous, we know we're as messed up as anybody else. But we have taken the promises of Jesus seriously. Jesus said that anybody that comes to him, puts their faith in him, becomes his follower, receives forgiveness of sins and eternal life. So, do you know that you have eternal life? Because this same Jesus, who has loved you every second of your life, has got you at a teachable moment when your attention is focused and your heart is sensitized, and he's saying, I want you to have eternal life. You were always destined to have eternal life with me. There is more. You were created for more. You were meant for more. This is a, a, a time of development and training, but there's more. Have you put your faith in Jesus? Because he says, if you have, you have eternal life. You don't ever have to be afraid of death. That was his claim. He goes on to say this in the 27th verse. He says, my sheep listen to my voice. And I know them, and they, what does it say? Follow. 
They follow me. To put faith in Jesus means we become his follower. We submit to his leadership. We immerse ourselves in his teaching. We let it mold us and shape us, and we live to obey him. Why? Not because we're afraid, because we trust him. We know that he loves us. We know that he knows what's best, wants what's best for us. And so we immerse ourselves in his teaching, and we follow him fully. And he says to such, he says, I give them eternal life. Notice it's a free gift. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish and no one can snatch them out of my hand. Jesus taught that he could give eternal life. Now, either he can or he's a liar. I believe his promise. John 8, 12. We're getting ready to land. Gear's coming down. Je Jesus spoke again to the people. He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but we'll have the light of life. What was he talking about? All this light stuff. Listen, light is, Jesus is saying, the truth about God and the truth about life and the universe, he embodies light. It is the tr truth about things. And Jesus is saying that those that follow him will always know the truth about God and the truth about life. And he says, they'll never walk in darkness. There's no reason to stumble. And then he goes on to say in the 31st verse, he says, if you hold to my teaching, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my, and what is the word? Disciples. disciples. If, that's a conditional promise. If you hold to my teaching, then you're really my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You have to translate that or, or interpret that in the context it was given in a Jewish world to be a disciple I alluded to it earlier in the message. It meant you, you sat at the feet of your rabbi. You loved the term to be covered in the dust of your rabbi. And it meant that you put your faith in the rabbi or the teacher. Jesus is saying, you put your trust in me. You submit yourself to me. You immerse yourself joyfully, willingly, continuously in my teaching. And he says, then you're really my disciple. And he says, you're going to discover some stuff. You're going to discover the truth about life and that truth will set you free. Now, you have to understand Jesus' use of freedom. Picture a fish when it's in the water. It is free in the water. Agree? It can move very quickly. It's happy. It's a happy little fish in the water. But if the fish decides, man, I hate this water life. I want to walk around on land like those people and jumps out of the water, the fish immediately loses its freedom. Freedom is living according to the design of the designer. Freedom is being the person, the being that God created us to be and aligning ourselves with the laws that he placed inside of us. That brings freedom. Freedom from fear, freedom from guilt, freedom from shame, freedom from false value systems, and a million other things. I could spend days telling you the freedom it brings. But Jesus said, only those that really immerse themselves in my teaching and continue in it discover the truth and they live with progressive freedom they know who they are they know why they're here they know where they're going they know what matters and what doesn't they live in the light of christ now no one's ever taught the way jesus taught and no one's certainly ever taught what jesus taught but nevertheless we know uh, masses of people could care less and i, I want to close with a um, a contrast uh, of uh, two people that they're both um, atheistic, or were atheistic at least. The one is a, a guy that's rather prominent right now. He's, he's a scientist and a skeptic. His name is Richard Dawkins. And in a book called uh, The River Out of Eden, he explains the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Dawkins, the scientist, says, the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Skeptic Magazine inter interviewed Dawkins, and they asked him if his worldview was the same as Shakespeare's Macbeth, that life is a tale told by an idiot filled with sound and fury signifying nothing. They asked Dawkins this. Dawkins replied, yes. At a sort of a cosmic level, it is. It's an idiot's tale or a tale told by an idiot filled with sound and fury signifying nothing. But then Dawkins goes on to say, you can have a, ha a very happy life and a fulfilled personal life even if you think the universe at large is a tale told by an idiot. 
that is so illogical, so irrational, it makes me get crazy just thinking about the statement. Okay? He's saying that you're going to live on purpose illogically to find some kind of happiness. But he made a choice. He's got the same evidence that everybody else has, and that's his choice. On the other hand, there's a lady named Holly Ordway. She was a, a highly educated atheist who thought Christianity was both a historical curiosity and a blemish on modern civilization. Uh, to her, the Bible was a collection of folk tales and myths, even though she had never read it. I have met so many people like this. Oh, we all know the Bible is just a bunch of tales and myths, and it's been mistranslated. Really? Have you read it? You might want to just try reading it. 99% of them have never read it. Anyway, she acknowledges this later. Uh, she says, though she knew nothing about Christianity, she mocked Christians and belittled their faith and, and their intelligence and their character. Ordway says, I had built myself a fortress of atheism, secure against any attack by irrational faith, said Ordway, and I lived in it all alone. Though Holly Ordway was not looking for God, it appears that God was looking for her. And she began to be drawn to matters of faith. One reason for her interest, she explains, is that her naturalistic worldview was inadequate to explain the nature of reality in a coherent way. She realized it could not explain the origin of the universe, nor could it explain morality. Uh, you know, if we're all a big accident, there's no right or wrong, it's whatever you choose. So she knew the illogic of it. After a series of conversations with a, a mentor and exposure to some helpful Christian writing, Ordway went from an atheistic denier of Christ and the truth to a fully devoted follower of Christ. She closes with this. Offering some advice to those who approach atheists, Holly said, Really, it doesn't matter whether you like Christianity or not. What matters... Is, is it true? It goes back to what I said earlier. All this talk of intolerance, it really doesn't matter what the rest of the world says. If Jesus is who he says that he is, and the evidence is compelling, then, then we have been taught the truth by our God. Our God so loved humanity that he came into his own world in a vulnerable humble form and Jesus taught everyone he taught with with uh, he taught people with dignity he taught people with sensitivity he taught people with love just like he does today through even characters like me and he calls one here and he calls one there and he calls us all deeper it's New Year's or it's after New Year's and so this is a good time for us to make some decisions and and I'm just pleading with you as a human being if you have not made your decision to put your faith in Christ and follow him fully I just wish you'd consider it seriously you're following somebody probably yourself and if you think you're better than Jesus keep on following yourself but if you think that maybe Jesus is at least better than you why don't you at least take this year 2011 that you're going to explore getting to know who Jesus is. And for we that are followers of Jesus, why don't we determine, man, this is starting right now. I'm going to become saturated in the teachings of Christ. I'm, I'm going to get into the New Testament with a fervor, man. I'm going to dig in. I might get in a growth group, but I'm going to dig in. I'm going to read it and read it and study it with a mature thinking mind, and God's Spirit will teach you and you will grow. You'll, you'll find out things about yourself and life and God that you never thought were possible. You can. Jesus came to establish human, ordinary human beings can read the Bible. It was the teachers of his day that tried to convince people that they couldn't. So why not make the decision, this, man, this is your year. You're going to reprioritize your schedule. And you're not just going to talk about doing something to elevate your, your spiritual knowledge this year. You're going to really do something. You're going to immerse yourself in the teachings of Christ. Well, let's, let's pray. Father, you, you know each of our hearts. You know um, all the things that are so personal to us. In some of us, it's, it's all different kinds of barriers and uh, issues. And some of us, it's all kinds of scheduling problems and personal hang-ups. And, and we just pray that in your kindness and grace, you'll just continue to stir our minds to draw near to you, to think through things. 
And Father, may it be true that everyone in this room will become those that follow you through the teaching of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen.